Greetings, YouTube. Today we're looking at Steampunk from the Uber RPG, and Uber is the name of the company. Um, actually, Uber Uber Goober Games. Intriguingly, they have a D20 on the back, even though this particular game uses a D6 dice pool. Um, now, the Uber RPG is a generic system. They have just kind of fitted this particular book to the steampunk genre. Well, it would be easy to pretty much do any kind of thing that you could think of, and we'll be getting into that in a minute. Um, and when it, the introduction is particularly good with this um, because it offers you a really nice introduction to both the concepts of steam and punk and the different ways you can use steampunk in a campaign. So it starts out and it's it introduces you to first the concept of steam and some of the things that you will find in a steampunk setting or can find in a steampunk setting. Each is going to be unique. Some will have certain aspects and some will not. Uh, the earth is hollow. The earth is actually a giant electromagnet. Elementals exist. Automatons and robots are possible. Cloning in weird bioscience is possible. It is easy to modify people mechanically. There is an air on all planets and moons, and possibly between them as well. Uh, the space between all things is the ether. Time travel is possible. Anything can be made to fly or swim. Babbage engines can do anything. Other theories, and then it gets into some uh, like atomic weapons and nanotechnology. Uh, and then they also talk about an alternative power source for your setting, which is Eldridge Copper, which is a particular kind of copper that not only can fuel all kinds of weird, strange inventions, but also has side effects. I mean, up to including people can grind it up and take it as an addictive chemical. Um, then they talk about the different kinds of eras that, that, that your game can fall into. Then they fall into the, then they talk about the punk section and what can that mean? Some common ways people might defy the norms of Victorian society in their outward appearance. They give some examples, some common things to rebel against, and again, some examples. Then it talks about steampunk worldviews. For example, um, if you're talking about steampunk, uh, the whole idea of where are you on the classism scale? So is it in the middle? Are there lots of poor and a very small majority and they have but they still have some kind of power and authority and there's a, a world view that gives them some rights or is it all the way over to the aristocracies <coughs> excuse me the aristocracies and the business owners just control everything with an iron grip and the poor are just completely being ground into dust like the eldridge copper that fuels their world um they also talk about adding in fantasy elements so lots of steampunk settings will also have things like elves and dwarves. Um, and they talk about, for example, dwarves are immune to eldritch, el, um, eldritch copper. They also can't use it chemically. Whereas if elves use it too much, they turn into goblins. And if uh, humans too much, they turn into like orcs and things like that. So you can actually change who you are and become another member of a, of, of, a, of a subspecies, essentially, by using too much. And that marks you as someone that has an addiction. And even if you're clear and clean now, you're not going back. You are what you are. So that marks you as someone who did have an addiction at one time in the past. And so I really kind of like that. They also talk about the either, which is an extra dimensional space and the extra dimensional space allows rapid transportation from place to place kind of think of it as in D, &D you have the ethereal plane and the astral plane that kind of a, that kind of an idea but it also allows rapid communication so someone can be standing in the ether and then people can use technology to look at them from all over the world at once essentially the ether becomes the bridge that forms a steampunk internet. But you can, while you can exist in the ether, it is in a completely a natural state. There is no water there. Um, there may not be air, depending on you want it to. There's no land. So you can't live there unless you bring these things with you and create a sub little colony or something if you want to. That could be an entire idea right there and then. How do you create a biosphere in the ether? Um, and there are people that can draw upon the ether to fuel magic if, you're, if your setting does in fact have magic. Or there are people who call themselves either mages who are just essentially engineers with a great deal of skill. 
at manipulating and using the ether through the application of their science and their tools and their gadgets and their steampunk things. So the game really lays down a rich amount of information and a lot of possibilities in only, what, what am I on? I'm on page 10 now. So in the first nine pages of the book, they really throw a lot at you. Then you get into the core concept. The core concept is a dice pool, and you're going to basically have, as far as skill applications are concerned, it's your stat plus the skill is the number of dice you roll. So if you have, say, uh, a two stat is the average, and this has the classic D classic D and D stats. So it's all the stats that D and D has: strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Um, so a two is the norm. That's flat normal. A one is someone who is below normal, and a zero is someone who's essentially in that field is is crippled in a, in a, in a very serious way. Um, and so you have your stat plus your skill. So if you have a four in your strength, you're very strong for a human. Um, and you have a four in um, brawling, you're really good at brawling. You have eight dice you're going to roll. When you roll your dice, um, a six, uh, a five or six is good. Neutral is uh, two to four, and a one is bad, but it gets a little tighter than that. You use a six as two successes, a five is one success, a two through four are no successes, and a one is a failure. And if you get more ones than successes, that's a botch. So you roll those eights, and you get six ones. You didn't do well in that particular round, let's put it that way. Um... All right, I have a cat in my way. I apologize for that. Um, so, and, and the number of successes you have is determines how good you are. For example, one success, trivial. Two successes, minor. Three successes, considered a basic success. Um, let me move my mouse a little bit. I'm turning the camera up. Four is strong. Five is total. And six is exceptional. Um, and... More successes than dice than than you have dice is a critical success. So if you get a bunch of sixes, you could actually have more successes than you have dice in front of on the table in front of you. And if that happens, you've achieved a critical. Um, and that's the basic core concept. And that's how you use uh, for, for figuring out your skills and such. Now, here we get into the weird part, and I need to look something up in particular. I apologize for uh, not having looked at this earlier. My cat is making this. Far more challenging than it needs to be. Yes, yes, she is. But she wants attention. Why don't you bug, go bug Lara? Okay, here we go. The combat skill section. This is what I was looking for. Combat skills do not make a character better in combat. The ability to, for a person to do damage or hurt another person is calculated entirely through powers. Now, I'm reading this out verbatim because I need to show you something that I found baffling with this game. So, let's go back to the guy who had the four strength and the four brawl. He also, say, has a four in, uh, in, in great clubs, large, blunt weapons, okay? So, he likes to smash things. Well, we'll say he's a troll or an orc or something. It doesn't really matter. Um, so, he's got eight dice. Those eight dice have nothing to do with how much damage he will do in combat. In fact, those eight dice when he rolls with his club are purely for show. To do extraordinary things. In the case of, say, a dandy with his rapier, to create, to do the classic Z in someone's clothing without hurting them. Or to fire an arrow and sever a rope and save someone that's just been hung. So your skill in a weapon has nothing to do with the weapon's damage. It is pure showmanship. You do all of your damage with the power section, and you buy the powers separately. Um, so you're going to buy your stats, you're going to buy your skills. You, they actually have um, different packages. So like you be, you could be a detective, and you could be an either mage. And those you get two packages you can choose from. Or you could pick detective twice, makes you a really good detective. You're like Sherlock Holmes. Um, so those give you bonuses, and they come with some they, they, a, a, a package comes with a prefigured pre cost when you're expending your character points to build your character. Um, this is a character point-based system. Um, and you put points into your stats. The top you can have for a normal person is a 6, and I think if you go above that, you have to do extraordinary measures. 
Um, and 12 is the absolute hard cap. Um, and I gotta tell you, this really gives me the vibe of someone that wanted D&D &D with a different mechanic resolution system, that wanted to avoid some of the open-ended things can go forever and wonder in and, and the up direction. They wanted to avoid that. And the second there, I mean, they use the exact same stats. There are abilities you buy in here. They call them feats and exactly what they do. They enhance your, your abilities and other things, your racial abilities, your, your magical abilities, or your tech abilities. But they're feats, and they call them feats. So it really feels, in many ways, like D&D. &D. The difference is they have divorced the combat from the powers. Now, when you buy the powers, for example, say you've bought Japanese weapons, and you can buy subsections of your powers. So you say you've got to buy those, and you get three, you put three into that power you've bought of Japanese weapons, and it could be katana, um, shurikens, and, and um, say a bow staff. And that gives you a lethal, a ranged, lethal, and a subdual. And that's the set you bought with that power expenditure, this point you put into it. That is how you determine your damage. I find this baffling. Absolutely, I'm not arguing with whether it's good or bad. I just don't understand the design decision. Why would you do this? This game is essentially a superhero game. Because the section on powers is so flexible. You could do so much with it. And I also think it's I think it's overly complex. I think it's more complex than like Mutants in Mastermind 3 is. And that's a pretty complex system for building a character. The character sheet example they give in here for one character was four pages long for one character. That's a little bit too complex. And that's not the guy's gear or his history or anything. That's just the character themselves. Their packages and their skill points and their, and their powers and how they're utilized and how they interact with each other and things like that. I just, I, I don't understand why they did this. Here's your skill and they completely divorced it. So over here is your power. But if I'm really good with a club, I think that that is what should determine my successes. I get the four strength. I got the four in, in, in great club. Boom, eight dice. You roll them, successes. Do I hurt the guy? His armor, they use a, they, you can, powers can be a dodge. Powers can be um, actual physical armor. So you may be, they may be just absorbing the damage that you're doing with that club. Or they may be dodging the, the, the attacks. So you take less damage because you only had a partial blow, that kind of thing. But fine, they've used their power to prevent themselves from being instantly crushed with the great club. But I think that the skill in the weapon should be involved in the damage the weapon does. That just, it's intuitive to me. And it's simple and streamlined. Whereas having a skill in a weapon and having a power separately just baffles me. This particularly when I find the power section, while incredibly broad and flexible, it can do anything. I also find it complex and that open nature of it just kind of overwhelms me. It just seems too vague. That could be my failing here. I freely admit this. But it's weird to me. I, I just don't understand where the inspiration came from to do that. If you're a great martial artist and you've got a six dexterity and you've put six points into martial arts like Batman did or something, you're, you're fast and you're incredibly good. You're the Bruce Lee of the world. And yet all you're doing is showmanship. And what's stopping from someone from having no skill in a weapon? You put no skill points into it. And then you just buy a power in it. So you're not showmanship. You have no mastery, apparently, of the weapon. You can just blow holes through walls with your club. And from what I can read in the book, there's nothing stopping a person from not having any skills in a weapon and yet having a very large, significant, impressive power in that same weapon. I find that strange. And you, and you, you can't build a character that doesn't have powers. You just don't buy armor off the rack. You just don't buy a pistol off the rack or a bow. 
you have to buy a power to represent that pistol or that bow or that armor. Incredible flexibility. Unbelievable. But I find it overwhelming. And I'm still trying to figure out what the design idea was for doing this. How did someone look at all the systems that have come before them that connected a skill with the weapon with the damage the weapon does? Or at least you have your great skill and then the, the damage of the weapon may vary because there's an, an inherent ability of the weapon itself. Okay, that's the kind of the classic way we do it in many, many role-playing games. And they decided, no, 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 we need to separate those two things completely. And I gotta tell you, I don't remember how many times I have seen someone use a weapon skill that wasn't in combat just to show off their skill or do something weird and freaky with it, other than like a bow. I seriously don't, maybe this many times in all my years, decades of being involved in gaming, even hearing about someone doing something like that, Doing trick things with weapons is the exception, not the rule. And this system seems to be saying, that's what you do all the time with your weapon. That's you should be doing these weird, freaky things to your weapon. Oh, by the way, if you actually want to hurt somebody, you have to buy a power as well. I'm not critiquing the system. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying I don't get it. So if anybody out there can explain this to me, I would really appreciate it. Do you have any experience with this? How is it in play? Does it run smoothly? Once you get their overly complex power system taken care of and you just get the character out there on the road and where the rubber meets the road, is everything okay? I also am not a huge fan of dice pools. I will admit that. Handfuls of dice being rolled. I don't mind rolling a handful of dice if I'm casting a fireball, but I'm not doing that every round. That's the exception, not the rule. I like the cleanness of a single die that gets bonuses or penalties. I find that streamlined nature to be preferable to a dice pool. So let's talk about this. If somebody can explain this to me, and if anybody who's involved with this book or this game can tell me what's going on, I would really be thrilled. I'm not critiquing. I'm not saying it's bad or wrong or anything. I just don't get the design concept behind it. And I want to. So let's talk about the Uber RPG Steampunk game. With in this, and a little blurb on the cover says, "Winner Best New RPG 2011 Gaming Genius Awards." I have no idea what they are, but it sounds good. 